Oops, sorry. Nope. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Managing Distress and Trauma for Essential Workers During COVID-19. Um, this webinar is being presented by Jefferson Center. A little bit about us, we've been serving Jefferson County, Clear Creek County, and Gilpin Pick County for over 60 years. We're a nonprofit, community-focused mental health and substance use services provider. We offer hope and support to individuals and families who are struggling with mental health issues and substance use disorders. I'm pleased to announce, introduce today's speakers, Jamie Schlickenmeyer and Joel Smith, both trauma clinicians here at Jefferson Center. Before I hand the mic over to them, I have a few housekeeping items to cover about the presentation. First, today's presentation will be available on demand after the live session, and we'll email that out to you. We'll also have today's slide deck available. I would also encourage you to visit our website at jcmh.org where we have more resources available along with blog posts related to this topic and more information about other upcoming webinars we're hosting. Next, please keep your microphones muted and turn off your video during the presentation. You'll also wanna change your Zoom view to speaker mode. And finally, we'd love to hear from you during the presentation. If you have a question for our speakers, please feel free to send it through the chat at the bottom of your player. We'll be answering questions at the end of the session. And if we don't get to your question during the webinar, we'll be sure to follow up afterwards. And last, we'd like to encourage you to follow us on our social networks and share the recording of this webinar and other information about Jefferson Center. So without any further ado, I'd like to kick things off by welcoming Jamie and Joel. Over to you. Hello, I'm Jamie Schlickenmeyer. I'm a trauma clinician at Jefferson Center. Um, it's Joel. Hello, I'm Joel Smith. I am also a trauma clinician at Jefferson Center. Um, Jamie have been, and I have been at the center for about four years right now, and we've been therapists here in Colorado managing and super specializing in trauma um, for more years than we would care to mention probably. Like, uh, years is how long we've been doing this. Uh, so we have both um, uh, put some thought into talking to you all about some skills and some issues going on right now um, so that you can better manage yourselves and your own mental health and the mental health of people around you during a time where we're all on edge, when we're all stressed, and when we're all having issues uh, managing our lives as in the same fulfilling way that we did before all of this happened. Um, so that is the oomph and essence of um, our presentation to you this morning. So yes, we will be talking about managing distress and trauma for essential workers during COVID-19. So a little bit about what distress and trauma is as you're experiencing it, where does it come from, how it affects you, and some things you can do about it. Um, so one of the things uh, we experience, oops, excuse me, as in the helping profession providing essential services is vicarious trauma. Um, vicarious trauma, the, the definition is an ongoing process of change over time that results from witnessing or hearing about other people's suffering and need. So as a mental health professional, we get this directly, um, but it can come in many ways as uh, essential workers, right? You can get this as a, a law enforcement, as working in a hospital, uh, working in a grocery store, right? Being in direct contact with other people's suffering. Um, when you identify with the pain of people who have endured terrible things, you bring their grief, fear, anger, despair into your own awareness and experience. Um, it contributes to uh, increased sense of responsibility, high expectations, feeling burdened, overwhelmed, and perhaps hopeless. Um, so vicarious trauma is like experiencing trauma directly and can deeply impact the way you see the world and your deepest sense of meaning and hope. 
More to add on this topic of how we're experiencing our traumas right now is the idea that while we're all experiencing vicarious trauma, every time we turn on the news or interact with somebody who's experiencing trauma in our workplace, we're feeling their pain. We're seeing, we're reading more about sickness. We're seeing it more on the TV. We're seeing it more on social media. But the reality is uh, we're experiencing our own traumas right now. We're shut in our houses. We're restricted from speaking and hugging the people that we know and love. We uh, can't go do the things that we love to do in Colorado. We're outside people. We like to go um, do stuff outside. And right now we're restricted from doing those things. Um, we have lost some of the freedoms that we come to know and enjoy. And all of that is for the good. And yet we need to acknowledge that we all are ourselves experiencing some kind of trauma while we're witnessing also other people's sickness and suffering. Um, so wrapping our head around all of that and knowing how it affects us um, personally is some of the stuff that we want to acknowledge today. And then also, what do we do with that once we acknowledge it? So like I mentioned, vicarious trauma is similar in many ways to direct trauma and it carries a lot of the same symptoms. Uh, and it can be treated in many of the same ways. And again, this, the uniqueness of this situation is we are experiencing both direct trauma and vicarious trauma. Um, so direct trauma is the result of an overwhelming experience where death or serious injury is a very real threat. Um, this can include war, terrorism, school violence, abuse, natural disasters, um, a current global pandemic, um, various vicarious trauma is often experienced by helping professionals exposed to another person's trauma. Um, so there's, there's just a few examples of people who are exposed to vicarious trauma and that list is a lot bigger now with essential workers. As you're uh, reading this list of things on this on the screen in ways that you can experience direct trauma or vicarious trauma, what I'd encourage you to do is just take a moment for yourself look at these things on the list uh, that include uh, direct traumas or vicarious traumas and be aware of how this affects you personally. What are some of the ways that you have experienced direct trauma in this? Um, what are some of the ways that you have experienced vicarious trauma from this? Um, and just read that and just take a second and be aware of how this pandemic has affected your life. Okay. <laughs> Said enough. <laughs> sure. Um, so a little bit of the differences between direct and vicarious trauma. Um, direct trauma is a direct exposure to a traumatic event, where vicarious trauma is the result of exposure to a traumatic event via another person's discussion of that event. Again, we're experiencing both, right? We have our own experience of this current crisis, as well as interacting with people, helping people um, who are also experiencing it. Uh, with direct trauma, people often feel that as a result of the event, their life and safety were directly threatened, right? Like we have to stay home to protect our safety. Um, we have to, and then we also have to go out and provide these essential services that affects our safety. Um, with vicarious trauma, a person often feels overwhelmed by the intensity of another person's trauma story. And that intensity can be really increased when you're experiencing your own trauma and you are experiencing the intensity of somebody else's trauma. Uh, with direct trauma, reactions are often delayed due to in the inability to fully integrate the event at the time it's occurring. So there's like a, a shock period, an acute trauma period. Um, but with vicarious trauma, Oh, they are also often delayed due to the focus on other people's uh, trauma. Um, with direct trauma effects often manifest as noticeable changes in thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Um, whereas vicarious trauma effects are often more discreet uh, and changes may not be as noticeable or they may not be attached to a single event, right? That's ongoing process of change as you're taking on other people's experience. Direct trauma, the traumatic event may be revisited after it has passed uh, through flashbacks or nightmares. Um, but with vicarious trauma discussions, uh, the trauma discussions may interact with the helper's experience with the current trauma or it can trigger memories of their own past trauma. So there's a lot going on here. One of the 
uh, important things about the pandemic event that we're all experiencing right now is the reality that we are experiencing this event both as direct trauma and as vicarious trauma, um, which is why we're highlighting this idea. Um, usually when a trauma comes along and slaps us upside the head, it's one or the other. Um, it's either vicarious or direct. But this, this trauma is so large, it affects so many people in so many different ways that we need to acknowledge that it absolutely affects us personally and directly. But it also, just the weight of how many people around us and how that is affecting us vicariously. This is a big, fat, heavy event um, that if we can slow down and be mindful of how it is affecting us, it's gonna help us a lot in the long run. Um, slowing ourselves down and breathing and take care, uh, taking care of ourselves um, is really vital to our process right now. Um, so again, as you look through this list, what I'd encourage you to do is to be looking at these ways that direct trauma affects us, looking at these ways that vicarious trauma affects us. Just take a second, read through those things and be mindful uh, of how these things are personally um, engaging our own lives. Um, how have your reactions been delayed? How has uh, how have other people's stories impacted how you're relating to yourself and how you're relating to the people around you? How are, have these things affected your sleep? How have these things affected your own thoughts and, and behaviors? We're gonna talk more about that, but this list is to kind of highlight us of getting your brain thinking about these things so that we can slow down and address them. I have clients who are essential workers and often they say, why is this so hard for me? What, what's wrong? Why is this bothering me so much? And this is what I often highlight is you're experiencing both direct and vicarious trauma. And here is why it's so hard for you. And that's okay. Yeah. Um, so other types of trauma that can impact um, your experience as a uh, health professional, a helping professional, an essential worker um, is secondary trauma. So indirect exposure to trauma through a first-hand first -hand account of events. Um, so a vicarious trauma, which we talked about. Uh, compassion fatigue, which is a gradual lessening of compassion over time. When you're overwhelmed with providing empathy and compassion, um, that can lessen and that can cause some burnout which is experience of long-term exhaustion and diminished interest. So um, these things also play a part in the vicarious trauma, direct trauma experience that we're all going through. Anything to add, Joel? I, th I think we're good here, thank you. Awesome. All right. Um, so our brains, oops, have what we call mirror neurons. This is a neuron in the brain that fires both when an animal acts and when an animal observes the same action performed by another. Uh, the neuron therefore mirrors the behavior of the other as though the observer were acting, were itself acting. So this happens when we see somebody cry and we well up with tears because we're feeling their pain. When you see somebody stub their toe and you flinch because your brain uh, interprets the pain that person is going through or recoiling when somebody makes a face, a disgusted face when they eat something bad, you physically feel that disgust and mimic that behavior. Um, the ability to instinctively and immediately understand what other people are experiencing. We have these mirror neurons for empathy development. Um, they're adaptive for survival. If I see fear in the face of somebody across from me, I'm going to respond with fear, assuming that there's something I need to be afraid of. Um, but it can also lead to vicarious trauma because we are taking on the emotions of the people we see in, in many different ways. Um, this can come from media exposure, like excessive media exposure. Uh, and it happens both directions. So we're taking on, on mirror, our mirror neurons are taking on other people's emotions and they're taking on ours. All our mirror neurons are are built and we're wired to use them to keep ourselves alive and healthy. In times like this, when everybody's going through a little bit of trauma or a lot of trauma, 
um, our mirror neurons can overwork and they can exhaust us. And we're gonna talk about the symptoms that we can feel from that in a second, but things to highlight from overuse and overactivity of our mirror neurons is the idea that we can be edgy, we can be angry, we can feel tired, our sleep can be low, we can be exhausted physically because of that. Um, we're not getting along with the people around us and our jobs just might feel tedious and horrible. So all of those things are happening while um, our mirror neurons are being overextended. Um, and again, we're gonna focus a little bit later on in this presentation about the idea of slowing down, acknowledging what we're going through and doing some concrete things so that we can uh, work through this and use skills to manage our own feelings. Um, and Jamie's gonna move on to the next slide. So uh, how our neurobiology is impacted by trauma and vicarious trauma comes in two basic patterns. Uh, we somaticize uh, this, these extra stress and trauma. So when mental and emotional stressors become physical, stomach aches, headaches, nausea, um, excessive tiredness, like our body will feel the distress um, and dissociation. So it's a partial or complete disruption of the normal integration of a person's psychological functioning. So checking out. So when stress and trauma becomes too much, the brain likes to check out. Anything here, Joel? Just to kind of expound, I think we're going to talk more about expounding in a, a slide or two later, but somatization means that our bodies are literally feeling hurt and pain and maybe some kind of uh, illnessy sort of thing because we're stressed the heck out. And dissociation means that rather than feel the pain in, um, in our emotions or in our bodies, we're gonna check out and leave that too. So it's a buildup of just kind of dysfunction if we do not attend to our feelings and our stressors right now. To avoid somatization and dissociation, we're going to suggest some things in a second for you guys to do. And these are good ways of identifying it. If you hear somebody in your life, somebody you work with, children excessively report complaints of physical illness or uh, notice them checking out, those are signs that there's this buildup of distress in their system. So some common reactions um to this for vicarious trauma as well as direct trauma um these are both physical and emotional uh trouble uh startling more easily so a little bit more jumpy uh trouble sleeping changes in eating habits eating more eating junk food comfort food uh, not having an appetite at all uh, increased in nightmares increase in drinking and smoking more so those external ways of coping uh, more difficulty concentrating. So it's harder to focus, harder to sit down and read a book, sit down and focus on the day-to-day -day things that we need to get done. Isolating is a big one for trauma, and now many people are being forced into isolation. And so that compounds it as well. Feeling increased depression or anxiety. Uh, so if you've never had depression or anxiety, that may be a new symptom for you. But if you already have it, it may be exacerbated by this. Uh, feeling angry or irritable, zoning out, uh, increased sensitivity. So like Joel said, uh, being snappy, everything is tedious and terrible. Uh, feeling lonely and unsupported. Something I'd highlight on this slide list is uh, sometimes right now it's hard to know what is a symptom of our own uh, trauma issues or what is just different because we've been forced into a world that's really different and has changed. So for example, uh, our eating habits, my eating habits are different because um, I'm not eating out. I'm not, uh, I used to have a habit of going to the store pretty regularly to get stuff. And we're not supposed to do that anymore. We're just supposed to go once in a great while and get a whole bunch of stuff so that we can minimize our contact with other people at the store. But that means I'm cooking things differently and, uh, and eating a little bit differently. I don't need to call that unhealthy necessarily, but 
um, because of how the world is different, it's, it's kind of complicated to figure out some of these things that are symptoms of trauma stuff or is just different because we've been forced into different behaviors. Um, so what I'd suggest to take a good look at that and look at your own behavior that is different if you're wondering about it and ask yourself, is this causing problems? And when you really slow down and think about it, I, I trust you um, that you will be able to have some good solid opinions about whether your behaviors are helpful to you or not. If they're helpful, probably not a trauma reaction. If they're not helpful, probably think about it <laughs> and, and acknowledge that maybe uh, you can use some time to reflect and, and change your behavior, which is kind of what we're gonna suggest in a second. Um, some common physical reactions, hyperarousal or feeling on edge. So again, that jumpy, easily startled, um, noticing everything, hard time kind of calming down, uh, coming down for the evening, difficulty sleeping, uh, and changes in eating patterns, as mentioned. These are specific to physical. Um, and again, these trauma responses are a way of our body saying, I feel like there's danger around and I want to survive. And so it's hard to turn these off sometimes. Yep. Um, difficulty sleeping is a big one to acknowledge if you're having this issue. And the reason I highlight that one is uh, for a couple of reasons. One of them is um, that just in terms of uh, pandemic stuff, um, our immune systems are not as good if we are not sleeping well. Um, so just in terms of staying physically healthy, it's important to sleep. But from Jamie's and, and my focus, we're kind of talking about our own mental health. Um, and if you're not sleeping, everything else has a greater potential to slide. So uh, in terms of being more anxious or more depressed or more edgy or more difficult in relationships or uh, really just kind of name it, if you're not sleeping well, everything else becomes harder. Um, so one of the things that we can do to uh, sleep better is really just straight up acknowledge that oh, I'm having trouble sleeping. What's that about, do I think? Is it about feelings? Is it about being cooped up inside all day? Do you need to leave the house and walk around and, and run or whatever it is that we do? Because that's allowed and we can do that. Um, and we need to make sure that we're doing that even though this is a time of altered schedules and altered anxieties and altered feelings. Um, we can still take care of ourselves and if we need to move so that we can sleep, we can still do that. And we'll talk about this more in the, the skills section, but physical symptoms often respond really well to, to physical solutions. So getting out of the house, uh, exercising, planning exercise, and um, getting your body moving can address some of these physical symptoms. Some common emotional symptoms, uh, prolonged feelings of sadness or depression, feeling anxious, feeling angry or irritable, increased sensitivity, right? Again, you're on edge. There's a lot going on and there's a lot that's not known. So uh, being more sensitive to things uh, and feeling lonely and unsupported. And Joel made a good point before about, you know, is this uh, a trauma reaction or is this as a result of being removed from your normal resources and supports and now you're missing something in your life and that's completely normal. What I also want to highlight on this slide is the idea that um, we're not saying you should not be having these feelings. <laughs> these feelings are very normal to have. And in fact, if you were not having any of them at all, I'd be like, what's wrong with you? Um, but it's how much we're feeling these feelings is what we want to talk about and what we do with these feelings and how we're managing these feelings uh, that are going to set us up for some successes um, during this pandemic. Uh, right now, uh, we're talking about, uh, the experts are talking about this pandemic as being something that could last for quite a while in some shape or form, um, and we don't have an end date. It, it's likely that we're somewhere toward the beginning of this process. So if we can establish healthy habits of managing our anxiety and our depression, our irritability with other people, how do we tolerate stress from our job that is increased because it's different, um, the sooner we get a grip on all of those things and establish healthier habits, the more success we can have as this pandemic can proceed for several months or even a year or longer. 
Uh, some common mental reactions, intrusive thoughts or flashbacks. Um, with direct trauma, this current experience can take you back to trauma you've experienced in the past. Um, there's a lot of similarities in responses and emotional feelings. Um, having nightmares, that's a really common one that I've been hearing a lot, is just nightmares about what's going on. Difficulty concentrating and zoning out, so some of those d dissociation symptoms. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> Some common behavioral reactions, uh, drinking more, smoking more, using prescription medications more frequently, and social withdrawal. So we're encouraged to social distance, right? And so uh, we're being removed from the supports we normally have. And sometimes it's common to turn to those external supports like drinking and smoking. You're home all the time. You're bored, that's what's there. <laughs> Yes. Um, there's, I, I think in, if people have been on social media or if, even if they've been watching the news or talking to other people, they have heard or seen people talk about the difference between social distancing and physical distancing. Um, so there's even a push to remove the term entirely and call it physical distancing because we don't want to remove our social contact with our friends and our family. That's unhealthy. We don't want to do that. That's um, that would be disastrous to most people if we just stopped talking and communicating with the people in our lives. Um, so reach out via via phone, via FaceTime, via Zoom, via email. Write a letter. Yell across the street. Um, everybody in Colorado Colorado is howling at eight. Um, if if you're doing that, do those things on purpose and mindfully to connect yourself with other people because that's super healthy. Um, earlier up on the slide, we uh, highlighted the ideas that these are common reactions to stress behaviors. Um, we're drinking more, smoking more, using substances. Um, be mindful of, of what more means for you. Um, it's totally possible that more is kind of a temporary thing um, as we're coping with a whole bunch of change all at once. And maybe that's not such a horrible thing. Um, for some people, more is bad, and more is bad, period. Uh, so if you uh, are prone and you already know you're prone to having um, a substance problem, uh, talk to somebody, and uh, Jamie and I are gonna give you some numbers and resources when we're done to contact some mental health folks uh, if you have this problem. Uh, but be mindful, be honest with yourself, and be honest with yourself for yourself and for your family members and friends. Um, Substance abuse is a real issue all the time, and it's especially a problem right now. Uh, some common relational reactions. So difficulties in your relationship, right? You're home with your partner all the time, or you're both working, or one of you is working, and it really changes the dynamic of the relationship. Um, marital discord, expecting the worst of others. So, in this hyper aroused trauma state, you're expecting bad things to happen and that kind of gets projected onto people as well. Um, or you're hearing terrible stories or you're watching news and a lot of media exposure about um, negative things and negative people can really impact that ongoing process of change. Um, and loss of friends. Again, here's another one that, you know, social distancing, uh, physical distancing, you're, you're cut off from the way you used to interact with, with people? Um, one of the ways that most people get through life in general is looking forward to hanging out with friends and family. Um, Friday happens and we're like, woohoo! And we jet off for the weekend and, uh, and we have concrete plans of hanging out with people. Whether that means hanging out in our own homes and people come over, we go hang out with happy hour, we go, to the mountains, we go, like whatever it is, that we have scheduled things with other people in our lives. One of the great difficulties of this pandemic is that we have lost our ability to do much of those things, many of those things. Um, the flip side is the people who we are connecting with most can also be the people who we feel stuck with and we, we might 
kill if we are just stuck with him at, at some point longer. So marital discord is a thing, relationship difficulties with our friends and families and roommates, whoever it is that we're living with, um, can be really difficult. As ironic as it sounds, as we're being forced to isolate, it is important to make sure that we're spending time apart from the people we live with. If we spend all of our time together, that ain't a good thing for a relationship. Um, so be mindful of that. Make sure that you can spend quality time with the people you're living with, but also make sure that you're spending time apart so that those relationships can still be healthy um, when we can spend time with other people. And uh, like we've mentioned a few times, these are common reactions. When a relationship changes so drastically, it's a common reaction to have difficulties within it. Uh, some spiritual reactions, disencouragement, uh, questioning the point, why bother? Cynicism and loss of faith, like trauma and this excess amount of distress really challenges our beliefs, how we see the world, how we interpret events. Um, it can be very challenging. These kinds of spiritual doubts and questions can be um, simply that, they can be spiritual doubts and questions, but they can also be uh, signs of anxiety and depression that can become a big deal if we don't attend to them. Um, so if you're having uh, these kinds of spiritual, oh, why did God let this happen? And feelings of being angry with God, that's normal. And I'd encourage you to have, uh, to acknowledge those kinds of thoughts and questions. Also, um, be aware of how they're affecting your mood in a, in a, in a healthy way. Um, Asking questions about your faith is healthy. If you're stuck on those questions and doubts and they leave a mark on how you're relating to yourself and other people, it might be something you need some help with. Um, and that can be a sign of that. So some personal risk factors when somebody is dealing with both trauma and vicarious trauma. Um, one is personality. Um, so just your personality in general, are you a sensitive person? Are you a less sensitive person? Um, do you tend to avoid problems or difficult feelings? Uh, do you withdraw from others when things get hard? If that's part of your personality, um, it's going to make this process more difficult maybe. And on the flip side, um, there's personality factors that can make it easier to deal with. And everybody handles it differently based on their personality. Anything on that, Joel? Uh, all of these issues highlight the differences in people. Um, so what I'd, what I'd stress about people is that we're all different and we experience um, trauma differently. So um, like personality is the top thing up there. Some people who um, have feelings, want to share their feelings with everyone and receive help from everyone. Um, and some people want to kind of keep their feelings really close and not share them with a lot of people. Um, those are differences that impact how successful people can be during a difficult time. Um, and they can also impact uh, how difficult this time is for them because we're in a period of kind of forced isolation on a lot of levels. Uh, so if you're a person who likes to share with everyone around you, um, maybe that's gonna be really difficult for you right now. Um, but the flip side is if you're a person who keeps your feelings really close, uh, maybe, maybe you're more equipped right now, I don't even know. But some of these uh, risk factors do set yourself up to uh, different lo levels of risk just based on who you are and what your own experiences are. Uh, so be mindful of your own uh, personality and your own experiences and how they have equipped you or how they might further your risk uh, during a time like this when everything is different. Um, and like Joel mentioned, personal experience. Uh, if you have a history of trauma, if you have a history of um, things similar to what's happening now, it's going to impact how you're interpreting the events, how you're interacting with other people. Um, the same way with life stressors, like this is a life stressor for everyone. We have things going on and we have to deal with this on top of it. So it's gonna impact how we manage the stress that comes with it. 
um, it can make you more vulnerable to vicarious trauma or experiencing some of those reactions more intensely. Um, social support. Again, like if you didn't have a good social support system before this and now the people you have are removed, um, that can make you more vulnerable. Um, spiritual resources. Uh, having a sense of meaning and purpose can be really impacted. Uh, work style and work setting, right? If you're, those have all changed. Uh, how we work, when we work, how our agency supports us, um, all of this stuff has been shifted and impacts how we're going to interpret and deal with this trauma and distress. So being mindful of what are your risk factors and how do I tend to them to best meet my needs. Um, another risk factor uh, in terms of us is 80% um, of behavioral health providers have experienced previous trauma. So we're going into the work we do with a large history of trauma. Uh, that's compared to 59% of the general population that have experienced previous trauma. So our past experience will play a big role on how we interpret and deal with this current experience. Anything you wanna add, Joel? I'm good, thanks. Okay. Um, some unique challenges that we face. Being an essential worker is a unique challenge. Everyone gets a stay at home order and you go off to work. That's a unique challenge. Uh, it's a high risk situation. Uh, high expectations, uh, increased caseload or workload, increased interactions with people when we're supposed to be decreasing our interactions. Um, and maybe your work is in a changing or an unknown environment. So all these things are gonna impact your experience. Um, most people, as we go throughout our work lives, um, change increases stress. It rarely <laughs> decreases stress. Um, so that's true with any kind of change. What is happening right now is even worse than that because uh, there's a big fat change every week, sometimes every day. Um, and those are not small changes. They, they affect who we can interact with. They affect how we're interacting them with them. Uh, it affects how many people we are allowed to interact with. Um, it affects our level of potentially becoming ill or sharing an illness with someone we love via interacting with them. And all of these changes that we're uh, experiencing, sometimes on a daily basis, um, affects our anxiety just in terms of getting somebody we love sick. It's a big deal. So all of these situations that, uh, that Jamie just highlighted on the slide really come back to, will someone get sick? Will someone I know get sick? Will someone I love get sick? Um, and all of these things are affecting our own stress levels um, with that idea. It's not about purely uh, the economy right now because that's another stressor that's big fat right now. Um, it's not just about uh, being cooped up inside of a house because that is a stressor right now too, but all of these high expectations and workloads and intense interactions and changes and high risk situations come back to the idea Will someone I love get sick? And, and that's in the back of our minds all the time. It is a unique challenge to this pandemic. We've never done this before, um, not on this level. And it's a lot of change, not just for ourselves, but for everyone around us. Um, and we're all experiencing this at the same time. Uh, so everybody is on edge. We can go to the grocery store usually and buy bananas and walk out and say, yeah, you have bananas. And now we have to wonder um, how many people am I gonna brush up against to, uh, <laughs> am I gonna get sick? Is somebody I love gonna get sick? It always comes back to that. And so uh, Jamie is highlighting the unique challenges of somebody who works uh, in any public place as an essential worker, highlights that idea. That not only do we have all of our other stressors, we have all of these other big fat changes um, that always come back to our anxiety about sickness. 
So acknowledging that is really important. And we're going to talk about some things in a second to do with our anxieties and our worries. So treatment and prevention, or maybe not prevention, but treatment and mitigation of distress and trauma, because it's normal and it's common. Um, some of these things seem obvious and no duh, and um, why don't I just do them? But these are the things that get left behind when distress and trauma increase. They fall off the list. So I'll let Joel take over. So what Jamie just said is, is entirely accurate. I, I doubt that we're going to say anything completely brilliant right now, but something that trauma brain does to us is makes us uh, feel like we can abandon our routines and that we can abandon some of the things that uh, we have always done for ourselves to take care of ourselves. Trauma brain doesn't always make sense. It's not logical or rational. And it tells us that some of the things that we do for ourselves won't work here. Um, this isn't a good enough solution to work for this problem. Um, so Jamie and I want to highlight the idea um, that you have for a long time been an expert on taking care of yourself and you still are and doing some of the things that you have always done for yourself um, are comforting, they're stable, uh, and will help you in these times also. So the first thing I want to highlight is to make your own uh, care for yourself a routine. Schedules are your friends. Whatever your schedule has been uh, for probably a, a while, a long time, to the best of your ability, keep your schedule. Um, so I have a schedule at work. I'm not in the office anymore. I'm at home. So for me, it's important to keep those same hours, even though my computer is right here and I can still talk on my computer at any old time. I want to make sure that I'm keeping the hours that I've had because that's my schedule and my schedule is comforting. My schedule is familiar um, and keeping that schedule is good for me and my anxiety. So I'm gonna keep my schedule. Um, there are certain times when people used to go to the gym. Gyms are closed right now, but uh, if you are a gym goer, take a walk, uh, ride your bike, do, uh, do exercises in a park or in your house, like wherever it is, um, you can do those things uh, as part of your schedule of exercise, regardless of whether you're going to the gym. If you used to have family dinners uh, at a restaurant on Tuesday nights or whatever, have family dinners at your home. If you used to talk to grandma and go to grandma's house on Sunday, call her, text her, FaceTime her, whatever it is. Um, keep those things that are your schedule in your schedule because your schedule is comforting, it is familiar, it is helpful. It'll make... Uh, It'll normalize whatever is going on around you to the best of your ability. Schedule your, are your friend. Uh, keep it to the best of your ability. The next thing on this uh, list is stress-reducing exercises. Um, the first thing that I would highlight is exercise. <laughs> whatever it is, it doesn't have to be super fancy. If it's just getting out of the house and taking a walk, um, I highly recommend it. Um, as Jamie and I referenced earlier, just the idea of physically leaving your house to solve a physical problem like perhaps not sleeping very well is going to be super important for your sleep which in turn affects a lot of your mental health after that in the long run uh, so these specific stress reducing exercises um, in can include yoga or meditation or visualization uh, if you're not a yoga person uh, you can youtube some things if you're not a meditation person uh, again, you can YouTube some of these things. Let me talk about visualization for a second. Uh, specifically, uh, several years ago, there was a, a study done on visualization. People planned on taking a vacation somewhere, uh, anywhere in the world, and they made a little schedule about what they were going to do, what things they were going to see, uh, what fun things that they were going to engage in. Uh, and they made this list of stuff, and they visualized doing it all and they knew that they were not gonna go. And it helped their depression and anxiety. Um, so I wanna give you that kind of idea uh, that visualization can be super helpful in, in a time like this. Even though we can't take vacations, we can't go anywhere, we know we can't. Visualizing doing it uh, can be super helpful. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube right now uh, that people have made available uh, where we can see art museums, we can see national parks, uh, we can watch musicals, we can do whatever it is that we do. Um, all of those are great visualization tools uh, for our own 
uh, anxiety management. We're gonna do a breathing exercise at the end of this activity, uh, or end of this presentation. So we're gonna, I'm gonna skip that for now and we're gonna get back to it. Uh, do exercise, do talk to your peers, do talk to your family, do talk to your friends, um, whether that's texting or FaceTime, yelling over the fence at your neighbor, like whatever it is, um, these are important things to do. Take note of your feelings, and what I mean by that is find a moment when you're quiet by yourself. This can be in the shower if you're busy with children, you know, all day. But take two minutes for yourself while you're washing your hair and be like, how do I feel right now? Am I anxious? Okay, I'm going to let the hot water run over my head. I'm going to smell the good shampoo. I'm going to just take this minute for myself and acknowledge that I'm anxious. Okay, I'm going to towel off and go spend time with my kids because that's what I have to do. Um, but taking that one or two minutes is going to be important for you just to acknowledge the fact that you're anxious, that things are different, that you have to do things a bit more mindfully, a bit uh, a bit differently. Um, while we're trying to maintain normalcy, it's okay to acknowledge that things are different. And seek support if you need to. People who are supportive can be anybody who you identify as a supportive person. If those are family and friends, do that. If you already have a therapist, we're here virtually, which is uh, not the same, but we're totally here and we're, we're gonna do the best we can until we can be in the office again with each other. If you do not have a therapist, um, Jefferson Center is open and so are other therapists and other agencies. Uh, and we're doing this uh, either virtually or even on the phone right now. A lot of therapists are offering those services. You are not alone and you are not bereft of help should you need that. One more service that I would say that is not on here that I, that I know is still available. A lot of churches are available um, and are offering Zoom meetings. They're offering uh, pastors and priests are offering phone calls and Zoom meetings. Uh, churches have small groups for support that are uh, having meetings on Zoom. Um, so if your faith is important to you at a time like this, uh, a lot of churches are offering those kinds of helps and services also. All of those things maintain normalcy and support and some kind of visual contact with people so that you don't have to feel alone and isolated during a time that is isolating like this. And the thing I wanna highlight from all the stuff Joel said is just because you lost the way you used to get something doesn't mean you can't still get benefit in a different way. So some self-care at work, um, seeking support from those around you who are going through the same thing you are, who are there to help you and support you. Um, finding that connection and knowing you're not alone. Direct trauma, vicarious trauma, this experience in general, everyone is going through it. So you are not alone in your experience. Um, does the environment you work in encourage self-care? Um, does it not? <laughs> And it's really important to identify positives and successes within um, what you do every day, within the trauma and the distress. I saw a lot of videos this weekend on Facebook about when patients get better at the hospital, they dance, they cheer, they throw a little party, and it makes everyone feel really positive about what they're doing. Okay. Um, some physical and behavioral self-care. Uh, Joel talked a lot about this, but trying to set a schedule in any way you can provides that sense of normalcy and comfort. Um, being mindful about your body, listening to your body. Um, when you get those somatic symptoms, I've had a stomach ache for three days. This headache won't go away. My body's trying to tell me something, and what can I do to address some of those symptoms? Um, balancing priorities, right? Um, a lot of people are struggling with having their kids at home and, and getting all this done and all this schoolwork and all this, um, all the things I used to do, I have to now cram into this different schedule. And so balancing those priorities, what's important, what's necessary, and what is not. Massages, saunas, hot tubs may not be <laughs> something you can do right now if you don't already have them, but um, how do you get something in that area in a different way? Anything else, Joel? I'm good. Okay. Emotional and relational self-care. Again, seeking support. There's lots of ways people are offering support and Joel went over many of them. Um, 
lots of, I mean, even as a Facebook group or a weekly meeting with your closest friends. Um, I also saw this weekend a lot of people doing Zoom, Passover and Easter dinners, right? Like I can't be with my family. This is a really important holiday um, to me and I want to connect. And it was really positive to see. Breathing exercises, meditation, visualization, movies and books uh, at the bottom there, non-work related activities, not watching contagion on your day off, not watching things that create a lot of stress when you should be taking care of yourself. Balance it with humor and fun and fantasy. Listening to music that's soothing and comforting, that's fun. Having dance parties with your kids, kind of encouraging uh, self-care in the whole family unit. Something that I would highlight too, as, as, as wonderfully healing as music can be to listen to, if you are, and if you're a person who plays an instrument or sings, um, do it. Uh, there's, there's something wonderfully uh, engaging in performing or even playing your own music, like not for anybody else necessarily, but just for you. Um, there's something that you can just kind of sink yourself into if you are a musician that is delightfully distracting from everything else going on. Um, the same thing I would say for journaling, there's something wonderfully distracting about writing. Um, if you're that kind of person who can just write, uh, not only is it, can it be super reflective, but if it's, uh, you're, just, you're writing words on uh, paper and some people totally talk about the idea of angst leaving your body through your wrist and it just comes out of the pen. Um, so if you're that kind of person, be aware of that, don't forget it. Um, some, doing some of the things that you have been good at for a long time um, are some of the best things you can do. Spiritual self-care, Joel uh, covered some of this. Um, finding a way to participate in a community that you value. Um, online, can you donate things? Can you still engage with things that provide you value and meaning? Um, types of prayer, meditation, or readings. I know both Jefferson County Libraries and Denver Libraries have uh, like really increased the amount of virtual um, books and stuff available uh, for their, because they're closed. So there's a lot more things to access. Um, talk about things that matter to you. Having a mindful like um, separation of, okay, the work day is over, now we're gonna talk about positive things good things, positives throughout the day, successes, things that matter to you. Um, connecting to the outdoors. You can't drive to the mountains and go on a hike, but you can go for a walk outside. Not today, but maybe when it's beautiful out. <laughs> um, solitude versus isolation. This one's really important, right? You feel isolated because you've been told to isolate, but trying to find value and meaning in that time, uh, maybe with your family, maybe engaging in things that are meaningful to you. Um, and it's okay to not be okay. <laughs> like these are common reactions to something traumatic going on. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know that I. Uh, in some ways, I, maybe I'd highlight this I, idea. A lot of um, the larger religions this time of year um, have had their celebrations. Um, so, um, and the the idea that a lot of religions have right now in spring is a time of renewal and a time of hope and a time of kind of reflection and peace and all that kind of good stuff. Um, that might be challenging right now. And I think because it's challenging, it might like I'm being, I don't know if I'm crossing a religious therapist line, but I think it's important to just kind of reflect on those things um, as we go forward and to not lose sight of the idea that thinking about hope and thinking about peace are important. Um, even when it maybe especially when it's challenging. So the idea that, you know, uh, renewal is, is hard um, is probably the best time to think about it. Um, how do we move forward and have some hope in a hard time is probably exactly what we need to be thinking about. Um, I always think about, um, I asked a kid once, he was like, uh, long story, but I asked him what the opposite of anxiety was and he was like, gratitude <laughs> and I'm like huh 
And then I really thought about it and it hasn't left me. So the idea of thinking about um, gratitude when we have anxiety is probably exactly what we need to do in thinking about growth and uh, hope in a time of difficulty is, is probably exactly what we need to do. So these kinds of spiritual self-care thoughts and questions are, are super important right now. So here are some resources on vicarious trauma that were covered in the presentation. For your reference, Joel will take over with the breathing exercise. All right. I think some of you have probably uh, breathed like this before. It's a deep breathing exercise. So I'm gonna make sure that I sit up as straight as I can and that my feet are on the floor um, if I am not sitting in a, in a place where I can put my feet on the floor, um, if I'm sitting cross-legged on the floor, for example, maybe that's good. Uh, if you're standing and, and your feet are on the floor, that's okay also. What we're going to do is, is a practice called belly breathing. And we're going to be very mindful of our breath while we're breathing and be mindful of how our bodies feel while we're breathing. This is an activity that Jamie and I do with anybody who might come into trauma therapy. Um, it's, it's kind of an idea of being mindful of our body and knowing that our body is bigger than our anxiety and that our body can successfully manage anxiety. Um, our anxiety is in us, but it is not us, is really the idea that um, deep breathing can help us have. So what we're going to do after we're sitting or standing in a comfortable place with our feet on the floor, we're going to take a deep breath through our nose and our belly, if we have our hand on our belly, our belly should move because um, it's called belly breathing. So allow our belly to move. We're taking in so much air that our belly will move. Through our nose, we're gonna hold it and be aware of what our body feels like where we're holding our breath in us and be silent. And then push that air out with our belly through our mouth. And we should be able to hear our breath uh, loudly, like the person who's hopefully six feet away, right? Um, can, can hear you breathe uh, because you're pushing it out like that. And we're just gonna do that several times in a row and be aware of how our body feels as we're taking air in through our nose. Push it out with your belly through your mouth. Again. Hold it and out. One more, in through your nose, hold it, out through your mouth. And then be aware of how your body feels right now. Maybe your shoulders are loosened. Maybe your face feels lighter. Maybe you were aware of some tension in your hands that isn't quite there anymore. Maybe you're aware of more tension. You just weren't quite connected to it before and breathing helped you be aware of it. And that's okay too. But as you're aware of your body, be aware of, is there a feeling you have in your body somewhere? Maybe it's peace, maybe it's anxiety, whatever it is, be aware of that feeling that you have and be aware of where in your body you have that feeling. And just acknowledge it. Okay, I have a feeling, whatever it is. I know where it is in my body. And as you have that awareness, just breathe again. In through your nose. Hold it. And out through your mouth. And again, be aware of your body, that place where you were having that feeling. Be aware of where in your body you're having that feeling. Is it different? Is it the same? Whatever it is, just be aware of it and acknowledge it. And that's okay. And this is a breathing exercise. Uh, we do this just to kind of center ourselves and ground ourselves and to remind ourselves that whatever feeling we're having, it's okay to have a feeling. We're people, we're gonna have feelings. 
um, and then we can acknowledge what feeling we have, maybe we might ask ourselves, what do I want to do with this feeling? Um, and do some of the things that Jamie and I suggested with managing our feelings uh, earlier on in this presentation. Maybe I need to exercise, maybe I need to reach out and ask for help, maybe I just need to socialize with somebody on the phone, um, maybe I need to distract myself with reading, um, maybe I need to watch trash TV, maybe, whatever I need to do um, is totally okay. But now we know that we have a feeling and we can have some kind of thought process about if we need to do something with that feeling or not. And that's what that exercise is for. Thank you, Joel. Uh, so now is the time. If you have any questions, you can submit them in the chat box. Um, I've also included uh, Joel's and myself, our contact information. If you have any questions, if you need a consultation about this, what services we offer, um, how to get services, um, we can help you with that. Jamie and I would be happy to hook you up with how to get uh, connected to Jefferson Center. Um, or with some other service that we might be able to hook you up with too. Does not look like there are any questions. Amy, Joel, um, we've, I've got a couple of questions that were sent to me. Okay. So um, the first one is, uh, I'm an essential worker and I've been working really long hours and have a few days off right now. Um, but when I come home, I'm just exhausted. How can I set healthy boundaries that allow me to take care of myself so I can take care of my patients? Okay, that's a good question and I'm glad you're asking it. Thank you for all of the work that you're doing. We completely appreciate you. Um, something that you can do is when you go home, um, I have two suggestions and I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth for a second because I don't know what kind of person you are. I, I think sometimes people can find a lot of value in structure. So if you go home and you know exactly what you're going to do, um, you're going to take a shower and wash it off. You're going to make something for yourself to eat. You're going to watch some TV. Uh, you're going to call a friend. Uh, you're going to uh, take a walk, you're going to run around the block, like whatever it is that you do. As long as you know what you're going to do and then you do it, that can be really reassuring to you when you do it. Um, so if you have that kind of schedule um, and you know that you have some really simple things that you like to do uh, that you can look forward to while you're working on a daily basis, I think those things can be really helpful. Uh, so. Uh, if you're a schedule person, keep your schedule and that can be super reassuring. Uh, the other reality is if you're more of the spontaneous type and you like that, I think that doing things uh, for yourself that feel like gifts, um, like uh, go to the store earlier in the week and buy, buy a special food, buy a special thing. Uh, but these things can feel kind of spontaneous for you and like gifts for yourself throughout the week. And sometimes that can be kind of helpful. Um, what do I feel like doing right now can be good if you're that spontaneous type and you can treat yourself as you go through a hard time. Um, those are some suggestions. Jamie, what do you have? Along with what you said, being mindful of you are working long hours in a difficult setting. And so give yourself small goals, right? You shouldn't be expected to run a 5K on the weekend when you only have a few days off, but getting outside, uh, doing something physical, baking myself a cake on the weekend, whatever it is, you know, setting these small achievable goals uh, that help you feel productive in that time and caring for yourself in that time. I'd also say, uh, when you're in a high stress, high work environment, such as you're doing, nobody really understands what that like, uh, except for the people you work with. Um, so if you are able to, um, I don't know what your work environment is like, uh, usually people are pretty tight with coworkers in, in those kinds of environments. FaceTime, Zoom with people, have happy hour virtually, um, because, Though that group of people understands your predicament and you can offer support to each other in a way that other people cannot. Uh, so take advantage of your coworkers in that way. Absolutely. 
That's great. And we have one more question. Um, my spouse is an essential worker and I'm torn because I know they need to go to work to make money, but I'm also mad that our family has to be put at risk when others don't. How do I handle this and still support my partner? Yeah. Yeah. Jamie, me, me? Go ahead. <laughs> You're like, okay. Um, I, thank you for asking that question. Uh, your your uh, anger and anxiety in this situation is real um, and uh, it's valued. What I would encourage you to do uh, is own those feelings and just sit with them and be with them at, at, for several minutes during the day. Um, because if you don't do that, what's going to happen is that they creep up and uh, it leaks out onto other people around you. And you, it sounds like you don't want to do that. You want to be present and supportive for your family. Uh, so what I'd encourage you to do, um, hopefully while you can be alone, and I know, I don't know exactly your situation. As a mom, sometimes when your kids are in your house with you, it's hard to be alone sometimes. But maybe while you're having a shower, maybe if you're cooking and the kids are doing something else, like whatever those moments are, if you can just be with your anger um, and do what you do to express that anger. Uh, if you can write it down, if you can text it to yourself, if you can um, think about it in your own head while you're, while you're in the shower or whatever, um, have an imaginary conversation with somebody who you can be mad at do those things and express your anger to yourself uh, while you're not with your family so that when you are with your family, you can be like, all right, I'm good. I just yelled at somebody in my head and I can be loving with my family right now. Because you're right, uh, you get to be mad, you get to be anxious, the situation sucks. Um, and you don't want to take that out in your family is what you're not wanting to do. Uh, hopefully those suggestions are helpful to you. Jamie, what do you have? Just to emphasize what Joel said is that those feelings are very valid. Um, and it reminded me that if you go to jcmh.org, we have free DBT resources. It's like an online portal of dialectical behavioral therapy skills and tools, which really help with balancing those conflicting emotions. So how do you tolerate being angry and frustrated and supporting and loving at the same time? So I would encourage you to check those out because they are wonderful and they're free. Good ideas. Wonderful. Well, thank you both. I think that's all the questions we have. So uh, Jamie, Joel, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that Jefferson Center is here for you. Um, we'll be here for you every step of the way through the good times and the bad. And so we are open and accepting new patients, uh, both via phone and telehealth appointments. Um, you can visit our website at jcmh.org or follow us on Facebook for more resources and information. And you can also reach us by calling 303-425-0300. Thanks and have a great day.